speed chess. I, I have pretend. But you know how in speed chess, you have so much time to make the move and you go, and you start, and then you got to go fast and click again. So hopefully I can click this thing for the second time after 15 minutes or less. And so, uh, since it's only just started. Now, you may think it's silly to start with some little drop and click it away, and I'm wasting my 15 minutes. But I've been warned that if you don't get people's attention in the first 10 seconds of talk, they will be on their smartphones. <laughs> and you lose them forever. Because multitasking doesn't work when it's of a cognitive nature. I warn you, please, do I still have your attention? Let's see if I can do this in 15 minutes. I better get started So here we go. You've enjoyed the cartoon by my good friend Sidney Harris. Now, Take a look at the lady on the left. She looks like she's in pretty bad shape. But when you suggest that she go to the infirmary and see a doctor, she may tell you, oh, it's nothing serious. It's just a common cold. And you've all known people like this. They look like they're going to die, and yet they're into denial about their condition. Now suppose that you just got over having pneumonia, and suppose there's a pneumonia epidemic at your place of work or your school, and you strongly suggest that this woman really does have pneumonia, and she needs to get a doctor pretty fast. I mean, she could have double lung problems if she waits too long. Now, what will it take to convince her that she needs to go to see a doctor? Now, how, how can you do this? How can you convince her that she just might have pneumonia? Now, what do you see before you? A list of what I'm going to call disconfirmations. Disconfirmations. Now, this is a disconfirmations of her belief that it's only a common cold, and that she doesn't need to see a doctor. And so you start to convince her that it, it's not just a common cold. You try to disconfirm her of that belief, and you say, well, you know, you got a cough, too. And she says, well, you know, sometimes you have a cold, you have a cough, and you look pretty tired. And she says, well, oh, isn't that characteristic of a cold? And then you say, well, uh, uh, how fast did that fever come on? And she said, oh, it came on like that. And, and uh, that's, not, that's not a sign of a common cold. That's a sign of something more serious. And you get the point here. You work your way down. You work your way down, and you're pointing out red flags. You're pointing out disconfirmations that it's only a common cold. Now, they don't need all these symptoms uh, to have pneumonia. But at some point, you hope that you have convinced her because each additional symptom helps disconfirm her belief that it's only a common cold and so at some point you're going to hope that she finally says, hey, wait a minute, you have convinced me that it's just a common cold. Now, let's see where we can go from here. We're not here to learn about pneumonia, right? I mean, that's not the purpose of this conference. We know what causes pneumonia. Pneumonia is caused, a uh, major cause is invasion uh, of our bodies by genomes. By genomes of certain viruses and bacteria. There are other causes, I know that as well. And these genomes are dangerous, not only to the individual who's sick with pneumonia. But these genomes are dangerous because they're capable of replicating. And they replicate and they spread from person to person. But we're not here to talk about pneumonia. This is not a medical conference. 
But we are here to talk about what goes on in your mind. Our minds, on the other hand, are susceptible to invasion of another sort. Our minds are susceptible to invasion by means. Thank you, Richard Dawkins. Our minds are susceptible to invasion by ideas, and these ideas also replicate by spreading from person to person, and pseudoscience is such a mean. And it replicates by going from person to person. Now, you know how you can prevent, prevent the spread of pneumococci uh, by a proper uh, hygiene and by appropriate vaccines, but what can you do to prevent the spread of pseudoscience, a meme? And here's my answer to the question. And it's a technique that was suggested by the article you see up here from the Journal of Experimental Psychology. We all know that people tend to focus on information that seems to confirm their belief. And this causes them to become inappropriately confident about views of reality that are incorrect. And we know we call this belief perseverance. We've all heard of, we talked about belief perseverance. Now, how can you help people overcome their belief perseverance? How can you help people realize that their confidence is misplaced? And here's how, I will suggest. And it's similar to the way we convince that lady that her belief that it's just a common cold didn't hold up under scrutiny. So, what can we do? We can teach people how to recognize the disconfirmations associated with their belief, their pseudoscientific belief, and then encourage them to pay proper attention to those disconfirmations. And of course, here's the payoff, and this is the payoff we're all looking for, and that is when they recognize enough flaws, when they realize they are flaws, when they see enough red flags, They should be able to say, hey, wait a minute, this belief sounds too good to be true. In other words, belief perseverance, and I'm going to come up with a new term in the lexicon of pseudoscience. Belief perseverance can be overcome by disconfirmation perseverance. New term in our lexicon. Dis Confirmation perseverance, and just to support this notion, I guess you're wondering, well, does it make any sense? According to this article, what I'm calling disconfirmation perseverance, it says, according to their study, only in their study, the listing of contradicting reasons, I'm calling them disconfirmations, improved the appropriateness of people's confidence in whatever they were believing. There you go, that's a learning curve for me. So, how can we convince people to, uh, to, uh, that their belief is, uh, needs this confirmation? Well, uh, here's how I put all this to the test. I created a course uh, at the school I taught at, the Eastern Connecticut State University. It was an honors colloquium. I called it Science versus Pseudoscience, and the methodology that I used is in line with what I was saying about disconfirmation, uh, uh, belief disconfirmation, and uh, if you want to take a look at it as a study, there's a sample size, there were four classes, this was a colloquium, only 15 students in the class, but I had 60 students to try to make progress with and uh, to study the results to find out whether I indeed made any progress. And to do that, I had a questionnaire. It was a questionnaire with 10 questions. 10 questions about beliefs. Do you believe in this? Do you believe in that? And the beliefs, of course, were pseudoscientific, pseudoscientific beliefs. And the answer had to be yes or no. It was forced choice. You had to say yes or no. It was completely anonymous, so nobody was trying to please the instructor and you know, show off. And so there were questions like, do you believe in alien beings from another planet or visiting the Earth? And questions about conspiracies and alien abductions and telepathy and 
you know, the, 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 the spectrum of pseudoscience beliefs, telekinesis, psychic predictions, ghosts, astrology, palm reading, the belief that the universe is less than 10,000 years old, as the creationists would have us believe. And what were the results? When they got the survey, before the course began, the majority of responses to eight of these ten questions was yes, yes, I believe that aliens are coming to Earth. At the end of the course, yeah, it was anonymous, no one was trying to please me with their, with their answers. The majority of responses to eight of these ten questions was no, I no longer believe that aliens are on the way there. So I, you know, it's worth, I ain't no statistician, but it seems like it would be, I don't know, make you think that you might be on the right track when you do this. Now there were two areas which uh, showed no change, no, no significant change whatever that means. And they were dealing with ghosts, and they were dealing with creationism. I mean, it shouldn't be surprising. It was surprising to me, disappointing to me. I made mean, no progress in those areas. But I think with ghosts, a lot of the belief in ghosts is based on anecdotal evidence. A lot of people say, I, I woke up and there was a ghost at the foot of my bed, or I went to Alcatraz and there were the ghosts of these prisoners. A lot of it is anecdotal, and that's tough, that's tough to fight. I saw it with my own eyes. The other problem with ghosts is it's a slippery slope. What is it? Ghosts are allegedly a soul that hasn't quite crossed over, and if you give up belief in ghosts, you might give up belief in souls, and if you give up belief in souls, there goes the ball game for you in your belief system. And the same is true about creationism. If you have a belief that the uh, scripture is literally correct, and here comes creationism, and you drop that, then you wonder about the rest of the Scripture. So, what was the course all about? How did the course work? Here, in a nutshell, is the essence of the course. How can a person determine whether a belief about reality is valid or not? The course began by helping people acquire an understanding of the characteristics of real gold, the gold standard. Real science. And, and just so people don't say, oh, you know, that, that, that uh, O-H-E-E-R, uh, you know, that's not how science works. I know that's not how, how science works. However, I, I, what I'm saying here is that is a way of rationally reconstructing progress in science. So I'm not suggesting there's a lockstep mechanistic way that science is done, as you know anyway. But what I am suggesting is you can view progress in science by a rational reconstruction using that outline. And it's very effective, and I, and I feel it's valid. So first they learn about valid science, but next they learn the characteristics of fool's gold, of pseudoscience, the red flags associated with pseudoscience, so they can determine whether their belief about reality has characteristics of real gold, of real science, or whether it is chock full of disconfirmations, chock full of the characteristics of fool's gold, of pseudoscience, and when they finally, if they recognize enough disconfirmations, if they recognize enough signs of pseudoscience, enough red flags about their belief, just like that lady with the pneumonia. They should be ready to say, hey, wait a minute, this belief sounds too good to be true. And you remember I started by talking about a, a chess game, and in a chess game, you know, you pop this clock when you, and you make your next move, and I haven't made my move yet. I'm about to make my shameless move. Here comes a shameless move. Okay. There you go. If you would like to know more about how it works, then you might want to take a look at this approach as developed in the textbook for the course I taught. Quantum leaps in the in the wrong direction. Second edition. Why do we need a second edition? Twenty years later, things have changed. 
But also, 20 years later, I realized that it really needed a, a specific chapter about the alternatives to medicine, which it didn't have as a, as a special chapter. Now notice I call the chapter Alternatives to Medicine, because as, as my good friend Harry Hollis pointed out, there ain't no alternative to medicine. It's either medicine or it's medicine, and then it's not medicine, you know. Uh, there's no alternative medicine. So I thought I was clever and I called the chapter Alternatives to Medicine. Harry was, was nice enough to critique it and point out a number of serious mistakes on my part, which I corrected. And uh, uh, Steve Novella uh, contributed some ideas to that as well, and it's a, give a shout out to him. So that, that's, I, I've made my move. I'm not ready quite to click the clock. But um, the man named Sidney Harris, whose cartoon you saw at the beginning, provided uh, illustrations in the form of about 40 cartoons to this book, just to make it kind of fun. And the cartoons actually make the point. And so I'm going to show you Sidney's final cartoon in the book. And he urges us in this cartoon to teach our children how to tell the difference between real gold and fool's gold. Beyond there. Yes. No, he can't really fly. No, the bad guys don't have a great gun. No, this cereal really isn't the best in the whole world, and though it won't really make you as strong as a giant. Thank you. <laughs>